My name is Pastor Josh Landers. For those of you that don't know me, and I have the honor of pastoring this church, a church that loves God and loves each other. Um, if, you, if you're new to this church, I would encourage you to um, just be open to the possibility that this church is not like other churches uh, in the sense that we are small enough that you will be known as a visitor today. <laughs> Um, and, and the love that people give to you, I'm so glad you're here, is meant, not meant to be uh, a problem because we are truly glad that people are coming to our church. But also know that Hillside is one of many godly churches in the area. I said this to somebody even this morning, that if Hillside's the only place God is working, we are in trouble because God needs to be working in all of his churches to serve all of his people. And so um, Hillside is definitely a small enough church that you can't just come in and just absorb, absorb, absorb. We need you to also be giving because we need people to serve in the nursery and work in the children's ministries, Awana, starting this week. Some of you are called to serve in the Awana program, and others of you are called to serve by giving things to the Awana program. But we are blessed to be a family that we care for those in need and ask people to care for us when we are in need. And I pray that that reality is something that you experience, but also we are a church that is very desiring to honor the Lord and teach what his word says, and so I pray that you would experience that this morning as well. Um, I've had a couple weeks off praying that I would be able to overcome this cough, but there are some thorns in the flesh, and God says to those things, my grace is sufficient to you, and so I have some water up here, but I pray that my cough doesn't distract anyone. Um, but I was honored to have Daryl preach last week, allowing me to focus on my family during the funeral. And there was actually a funeral we had this week for Larry Beck on Thursday. Larry and Audrey Beck, some of you know them. They joined our church in about 2015 and were uh, with us pretty much all the way up through COVID and then have been watching from home in times like that. But um, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for caring for our church family. Um, this is not just something that I check a box to do. I'm honored to do it. And the Lord has so far given me the strength and the ability to fulfill his ministry. But I'm not perfect, and I need your prayers. Um, and even in this morning, I appreciate your prayers for the Lord to use me to teach his word accurately. I do encourage us to remember that we are not to be called to just be hearers of the word, but doers also. And so... I'm well aware that there are a lot of things we can be doing, but I pray that to this morning, because of the message of the God's Word, that we will leave changed in some capacity, because God's Word is meant to grow us, to correct us, to encourage us. And we are in the middle of a series called Shepherding God's Flock, Shepherding the Flock of God, and, and this is something that the Bible does for us. It's something that Lord willing I will do, our elders do, but we'll even see this morning how we do it for one another. The church is called to shepherd one another. I ran across this uh, warning sign on the internet. Uh, notice, uh, read and understand an operator's manual and all other safety instructions before using this equipment. And some of us, if we're honest, have seen this sticker and disregarded it. Because I don't care what the owner's manual says. I know what I'm doing. I'll refer to it if something breaks or if I get stuck. Maybe in that term, I'll just find a YouTube video because sometimes those are a little bit easier to watch than reading the owner's manuals. My observation of owner's manuals, even in my own life, is kind of like speed limits in Chicago. There for recommendation, but no, nah, not that important. Unless a cop is nearby, then I slow down to the speed. But, but in reality, we often find these instruction manuals and this uh, even... Um, recipes for baking or things like that. And we, we get to a point in time where we get confident enough that we don't need it anymore. And my concern is, the possibility is that we as a church, we as Christians, start to live the Christian life so much that we stop referring to the instruction manual. But I, I don't need it. It's, it's there in emergency. It's there when I really have a question. But, but I think I know what I'm doing. And we'll see today's passage referencing this instructions for the church that they're not meant to be kept on some shelf. They're not meant to be available upon emergency. They really are marching orders, like a playbook for somebody that's on a sports team. Learn this and let it guide our life as a church. And we'll see in the chapter 5 of this letter, chapter 5 up to 6-2, that there are some things that Paul is asking Timothy to do for himself, but also to instruct the church in following. 
So if you would, please stand as you're able for the reading of God's word. We'll read all of chapter 5 and the first two verses of chapter 6. This is the word of the Lord. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened, so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and the frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicu conspicuous going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not can not remain hidden. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers, Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. This is the word of, teach and urge these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father God, we believe, as the word says, that your word is alive and active sharper than a double-edged sword, able to pierce through bone and marrow. Lord, I ask that your word would move in us today, instructions for the local church on who you've called us to be. But God, I also ask that it would move in the hearts of us individually and in our homes to know who you've called us to be. God, I'm well aware that the message that I preach is not a message that they need, but a message that we need. So I ask, Lord, that even my own heart would be receptive to hearing the teaching of your word. 
because God, we all have room to grow. For the goal is not better than our neighbor, but more and more like your son. To that end, Lord, we need your help. We need the Holy Spirit to encourage us, to correct us, to teach us. So allow us this morning to be teachable, correctable, but also, Lord, allow our hearts to be encouraged because you give us the strength to accomplish your will for our lives. And to that we say thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, some of you, seeing the length of this text, being uh, 27 verses, might be concerned of time. I will still maintain a normal sermon length. Um, But I do think that there is something powerful about the idea that all this text brings together. I'm a verse-by-verse preacher, so after today, next week, we'll pick up in 6.3. But um, I think there are three components that we'll really see in this morning's message answering the question of what should describe God's local church. And this should describe God's global church. All churches should have these things true about it. But I want us to be thinking about what it means for us specifically, for here at Hillside, or for those that might be hearing us online, whatever church you consider your home. There should be things that are true about that specific church as well. Not so much just of the global church that it doesn't land in the local one, but I'm going to specifically ask what should describe the local church of our God. Well, the first thing we see is that the local church of God should care for one another as family. And we see this in the first eight verses of this chapter, that we should care for one another as family. Look at how it starts here in verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. And it goes into the other pieces that men that are young as brothers, women that are older as mothers, women that are younger as sisters, in all purity. Now, (coughs) the only verbs that are in this are the verbs of rebuking at the beginning that we should not do, which would be uh, judgment for the sake of belittling. (laughs) It's... you're doing this terribly and you've never done it right kind of a mindset. The opposite of that, rather, is the encouragement that we should do all these things then as the verse ends in all purity. Now let me encourage us, church, to be thinking about this. To rebuke somebody is to see something that is wrong and call them out for it. What the text does not say is, it doesn't say only think of the good. (laughs) I want us to redefine, you can do this even in your Bibles, that encourage both is easy to hear and hard to hear. When I encourage you, it's desired and I don't like hearing it. Because there's an encouragement that what you're doing is good, keep it up. But also an encouragement to do things better, to do things different, to do things that honor the Lord. So as we encourage one another as family, that doesn't mean we don't say the hard things. What's the difference? It's the motivation of the heart to our desire that they would be improving in their life, that they would be growing in their walk with God. It's the why we say what we say. It's the how we say what we say, not necessarily the what we say. So for an example, let's say that there is a family that is honoring the Lord and raising their children, I can encourage them in that regard. But if they're going through marital struggles, I can encourage them to take their problems to God, to talk to one another about what's going on. And that might not be something that's easy or fun, but I can encourage them to do the hard thing. Now, we live in a world that wants to just have tickling of ears. In fact, the three points that I want to give you this morning of treating the, fam- the church's family, taking care of the needs of the people, and uh, taking care of your leaders could be a really quick 10-minute ear-tickling message. But one of the things that's really hard about this is that I think many of us, if we're honest, have a, a faulty, a broken, a painful definition of family. Therefore, considering the church as family is actually not a very good thing. Let me be honest. I have two children, 10 and 8, and as much as you would like them to be perfect, they're not. They need to be saved by the same blood of Jesus Christ as you and as me. 
But there is a difference, isn't there, in the children that we see of how they treat their siblings versus how they treat their friends. I mean, we see this all the time that my, my son will, will hang out with and will care for and will be very forgiving to his friend, but if his sister doesn't put his toy back at the right place, then it's, be careful because there's problems in the house, right? And sometimes we can say, you know, I, I view you as my friend is actually a higher calling than it is to view you as my brother. That's not the intention of the Bible. Similarly, if you have ever had a bad relationship with your father, it's hard for you to pray the Lord's Prayer, maybe because our Father who art in heaven, but we can't define God as our Father by what the earthly fathers have done or not done in our life. Church, let me encourage you to say that when the church is family, should be an upgrade, not a downgrade, a relationship. Some of us, myself included, we are everything to everybody. And then when I get home, I have nothing left. So you just get whatever I have left. And I I was so patient with that person when I was ministering to them in the hospital. But my kid doesn't put his dishes away, and I get really upset. Because sometimes when we're home, we're not treating our family with a lot of love and respect. But think about the time when this was written. And even backtracking 50, 100 years in our own culture, family was like all you had. Family was the team that you were bonded to because we might move from place to place, but we are together. I have my brothers and my sisters with me and my mom and my dad, and it was a tight-knit group. Family meant in the past a place where you were loved, protected, provided for. That's what God would desire the church families to look like as well. Let me just offer an encouragement, not a rebuke. But Lord willing, the families of those of Christian homes should look different than the families of the non-Christian homes. Would we agree? I mean, we're called to be, love is long-suffering, it is patient, it is kind. And so as a godly father, Lord willing, I will father my children differently than I would without Christ. I love because I've been loved. I forgive because I've been forgiven. That we would have this holiness, this set apart for a purpose reality, even in our earthly homes. I would love to interact with you all as my fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters, because I think that that is a good relationship to have, a place where I don't have to pretend for anybody. I don't have to put on a certain mask because I need to be the jock at school or something, or I'm the smart kid, or I'm the bully. I mean, Family knows who you really are. There's no hiding. But that's actually, by God's design, supposed to be a good thing. Not a time for us to backstab or blackmail because I know certain things about you and I'm going to air your dirty laundry out to the world. No, family should be a safe place. Now, I'm well aware that those that I'm speaking to, that's not true for your life, maybe. Maybe family for you is always painful, always hard always full of hypocrisy and you're not sure who's truly on your team and who, who's for me and who's against me and there's a lot of confusion in that regard and I would say that's not what God would want family to be and the church should be a place that redefines family as God wants it to be where the leaders are leading and where we're encouraging one another as brothers and sisters in Christ It says to do this in all purity in verse 2, with a pure heart, with pure actions, with a pure attitude. (laughs) Look what it says continuing on in verses 3 and 4. It says to honor widows who are truly widows. It'll talk later about caring for their physical needs, but honoring one another. I pray we do this for each other, that there are people in our church who feel honored, not because of what you've done, but because of who you are. Younger generation, we need to honor the older generation because they've gone through a lot more life than we have. We have a lot to learn from them. They're not know-it-alls, but they're no more than we know. (laughs) And they're not perfect, but they would love for you to not follow in their footsteps of the mistakes they made. So listen to the stories, listen to the encouragements. I pray that the older people in our church are mentoring the younger people Now, biblically, even in this text to Timothy, right, there are some of us who are old in physical age, but young in spiritual age. 
I think the mentoring doesn't have to necessarily be based on the age on your driver's license. There are some of us who are more mature in the age of our spiritual walk who need to be mentoring the young in the faith, no matter what their age is. And so this idea of mentorship, honor. Look what it says in verse 4, though. If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household. Makes them return to their parents, for it's pleasing in the sight of God. The Bible says that the commandment of honor your mother and father is unique because it comes with a promise. Remember Jesus said that? That if you honor your father and mother, then you'll have more uh, blessed time in the land, the Bible says in the passages of Deuteronomy. Now, church, I bring this up because as much as we would like the church family to replace our earthly family, that's not what God would want either. I cannot fill the void for you to be a brother in Christ because you have an earthly brother who you no longer talk to anymore. I think God would desire for us to, if possible, be at peace with all men and women, (laughs) to do all we can to come alongside people. And what I would encourage you to is, it doesn't mean you have to attend family reunions. It doesn't mean you need to take people out for meals. But let me encourage you to continue praying for those who God put in your life. Who God has as your mother and as your father are not a mistake. God put you in a family with certain brothers and sisters for a reason. (laughs) And maybe those reasons are easy to see because you're blessed by them, but maybe also you're the salt and light that God will use to show the gospel to them. Don't neglect the nuclear family that God has given you and just say, I have the church family only. It says here, if a widow has children, let them first do these things. So, Take care of our own. Take care of those that are in our family. But in verse 5, she who is truly a widow is left all alone. Right? There's this loneliness that we're supposed to care for the people in a special way. There's a quote that I want to share with you from um, a lady regarding the nuclear family from Nancy Piercy in a book she wrote called Love Thy Body. And it says, Before the Industrial Revolution, the home performed a host of practical functions. It was the place where people educated children, cared for the sick and elderly, ran family industries, served customers in the community, and produced a surplus to help the poor. The home reached out to the wider society. This is what God intended the home to be. You might see this even in like uh, Little House on the Prairie, for Laura Ingalls and her father and all the people that are there and they're kind of creating their own little environment. They're educating the kids. They're taking care of the people and sharing to the people around them that this is what God would want a family to be. Again, the government has offered a lot of these things instead of what the church gives or the family gives. But God's design for family is not what culture tells you family is today. I think the world around us, at least, is really attacking the family. It's actually making the family kind of unnecessary, maybe. And that would not be what God would desire. That would be a lie from the devil. God, the devil attacks it because it's very gospel-driven. <laughs> if, a, if a godly family is being godly, it models love, it models care, it models a unique environment that's different. So your home can be that beacon of light. And again, Lord willing, our church will be as well. Now, they continue on to some other concerns, talking about this family. Talks about this woman who can be cared for as a widow all alone, verse 5. Her hopes on God, she's praying, she's offering supplications, that's praying for other people. (coughs) Night and day, but she is left indulgent, is dead while she lives. If she's like taking care of herself, self-indulgent, right? Indulging in her pleasures, pursuing what she wants. She's already experiencing death. Command these things so that they will be without reproach. But look at verse 8, church, because I don't know if we believe this, but this is what the Bible says. All Scripture is (laughs) God-breathed, profitable for teaching and correction. Some of you would never highlight verse 8, but let me apply this to your life because it hit my heart. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives especially for members of his household. He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's what the Bible says. Now, church, the Bible says that we love. Why? Because we've been loved. We forgive because we've been forgiven. 
As much as I want you to be giving to the ministries of our church and attending our church functions, you cannot neglect caring for those in your household. That doesn't align with the scriptures for what we're called to be as people of God. Provide for the relatives, especially those in your household, because we are transformed by the blood of Christ. Second of all, we see is that as the church, we should describe ourselves as caring for those who are in need. The second thing again, we should be a church who cares for the needy. In verses 9 through 16, you'll see that Paul emphasizes a defense of the widows. And let me just explain to you, though Paul does emphasize the widows, the Bible does emphasize widows and orphans and those who are in need being far beyond just the widows. But he gets very detailed in regards to how we should treat these widows, and I will take from it for some applications of applying it to any who are in need. So this morning, you might be here in need of help from the church, and you're not necessarily a widow. The Bible is not saying, forget you, wait till you're a widow, then we'll care for you. That's not the intention of Paul's writing here. But look what it says. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of only one husband, and getting into this reputation of all she does. And one application or one thought I want you to have is that we as a church need to get to know people. You can't know the facts of this woman as being accurately true to the scriptures if you don't hear her story, if you don't ask her the questions of, hey, what has life been like for you? Have you ever been married? Do you have any children? And there's a relational piece that as we as a church care for people, it's not what's your name, what's your social security number, and how much money is in your bank account we can or can't help you. Right? We're, we're not solving problems. We're ministering to people. So one thing as a church we need to do when we think of benevolence, when we think of ministering with our finances and our time and our emotion, is get to know the people who come asking for help. He goes on there and talking about that she is devoted to every good work. Verse 10, she's washed the feet, shown hospitality. This, this is a woman who in this regard, this widow, a woman who is not just asking because she's never done anything for the Lord. She's actually being blessed for what she's done in her season of giving to now be in a season of need. Now, this is different in our culture than those that are just leeches, people that are just entitled to always be given things. I need, I deserve. Well, this is a woman who has been very hospitable. She's been very generous. It's easy for the church to respond and say, you know what, you've done so much for other people, we'd love to help you out. <laughs> now church, again, I think there are people who demonstrate the fruit of their life that make it a really easy response of, Let me, can we give you some meals? Now, God's called us to love the unlovable, but we should see an opportunity for us to live a life so that when we are in need, people are like, how can I help? <laughs> some of us, if we're honest, Observe people that when they are in need, there's nobody to help. Because in the life they live, there's no friends that even think they're worthy to help them. And in that regard, the church should be ready to respond to them too. But look what it says in regards to these women, these widows. Verse 11, Refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry. And so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Now let me explain again. Paul's theology, Paul's understanding is if you're not strong enough to fight the temptations of the world, then marry. That's what he often will say. He's like, I prefer that you remain single so that you can be devoted to the Lord. But if you can't control the passions, then marry. And there's an element there that the, the issue here is not on marriage. What does it say? It says that they... Draw, are drawn from Christ, verse 11. It says that they have abandoned their faith. So the issue here is that there are women who feel like, if I don't have a husband, I can't be cared for. If I don't have a provider in my life, I'll probably go starving. Why? Because they've forgotten that God is the shepherd, that God is the provider, God is the protector. Christ is enough for me, we would say in our current world. So this woman does not need marriage in order to survive. There's an issue here where she's pursuing something, forgetting that God is her provider. And so, verse 12, they incur condemnation for having abandoned their faith. Speaking of these women, though, he judges in this regard that they are, they're idle. They're going from house to house, and 
gossiping and busybodies. They're just doing things in the world that really have no purpose. They're saying things that shouldn't be said. <laughs> I think, again, speaking of encouragement, not rebuke, Paul is concerned for these women. He, he's desiring that they would, uh, if they're young enough, remarry and be under the leadership of a godly man that would remind them of the godly things that are true in their life. And there are others that remain in this widowhood that would, don't forget about the faith, don't forget about our, like, if God cares for the flowers of the field and the lilies of the field, Birds of the air, how much more does he care for you? He's going to provide for you. You don't need a man in order to have those things provided. But he does say in verse 14, he would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage households, give to the adversary no occasion for slander. Verse 15, for some of straight after Satan. Again, I think the issue here is not so much the what, but the why. The motivation of the heart for pursuing these things. If, if a woman's husband dies at a young age, he's permitting them here to, to remarry, to have children again and pursue the things that your heart is longing after. Don't feel judged for those things. But we also know that we don't need to have children to be loved by God. We don't need to have a husband to be loved by God. God uses single people. Guess what? Jesus never married. Paul never married. <laughs> so marriage is not what God is after here. He's after the heart of is God enough? And then at the very end there it says, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them, for the church may not be burdened, so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Church application of this to our lives. One, we need to fully understand what are the needs of the people that come to us. Now, I think in the world we live in today, people have a different they define wrongly needs versus wants. And I mentioned this in Sunday school, but I think it's a good application. There might be somebody that's coming to us asking, can you help us buy a third car? And in our world today, maybe they feel like it's a need because I have a car and my husband has a car, but now my teenager needs a car. And th there can be that, but there are some that have no cars. And so we'd have a comparison of, is it really a need or is it a want? And part of it is just educating people on the conversation of what do you need? What do you want? But also we need to understand that there's a certain thing that we do that actually helps them, and there's another thing that we do that actually keeps them in need of help. There's a book out there that says, uh, When Helping Hurts. And there are actually times whenever we throw money at people that it keeps them in a position of dependency. This is actually what I think happens even in the government when people are living on food stamps and things, that they are not in need of pursuing self-independence because the government or other people are giving them everything and they are happy with where they are and they are not really needing to get out of that situation. And I think the idea here would be, who has God called you to be? How can we help you with where you are to where God wants you to be? But church, this all requires for those in leadership and those in the church, a relational intentionality of getting to know people. Right? Our benevolence money can't just be a person calls and says, uh, when were you born and how much money is in your bank account? Yes or no, based on that information. I need to get to know the person. I need to find out what's really going on in your life. How can I pray for you? It's very relational. But also, church, I want us to understand that there are people that are needy as singles in our community that have no family or no friends because they just moved here. And there are needy people that are young families who have children and can barely buy diapers because of the struggles of the life that they're in. And there are people that are struggling, through, that are needy, that just are going through a divorce. And there are people that are needy because they just got laid off of their job. And there are people that are needy because they're the boss of a company and they're struggling because of the pride that's around them. I mean, there are needy people all around us. And the, what he's saying here for the idea of widows is that we need to get to know them but we also need to assess the situation because there are some that are requesting help who really don't need the help, like the widows with family who can take care of them. And what we need to see is when I as a pastor or we as a church use money or time for person A, I can't use it for person B. I mean, I can't be in two places at once. If I pay this NIPSCO bill, I can't pay that one if there's a limited number of funds. And so what we need to do is, Lord, give us your eyes, 
Give us your ears to assess the situation. And Lord willing, the issue is going to be that people will bring true needs to the people of God. To be honest, ministering here in Crown Point, Indiana, my bigger concern is not the needs coming to the church, but the boldness of your prideful hearts and my prideful heart to be too bold to not ask for help. I mean, we live in Crown Point, we live in Northwest Indiana, and for you not to be able to pay your mortgage, just that doesn't sit well out there. So to say, I need help paying these bills is really a hard thing for us. But church, let me say, if there are needs in your family, the church should be a place where you can bring those concerns, where there's no judgment. (laughs) Maybe you just need a a bag of groceries. Maybe you need somebody to provide you a meal this week. That's okay. Let us be that for people. If our benevolence fund went with zero expenditures this year, that would be a failure of the church. One, in responding to needs, but another, maybe not in asking for help. And my encouragement to all of us is that we should be so loved by God and by his family that we are truly asking for help when we need it. And we're not asking for help to use the funds or the time when we really don't need it. And that's a struggle because there are people, somebody's at the front door, someone has let them in. There are people that are um, taking advantage of the system. There are people that in that regard, Lord of willing, there's a security guard out there. Um, But there are some people that truly need help. And there are people that, and maybe this is true even in your life experience, that they've hopped from church to church, and they've gone from soup kitchen to soup kitchen. And the question we would ask is, how can I get you not just head above water, but how can I teach you how to swim? How can I teach you to teach others to swim? (laughs) Because God really desires us to be giving. Better to give than to receive. Church, may we see those in need and have his help to pursue the difference between wants and needs. Finally, we see this third point is that we need to be caring for those whom God puts over us in leadership. Third point of this text is that we need to care for those in leadership. The text starts here in elders, specifically, he's talking about the leadership within the church. But if you turn real quick to 6, uh, 1 and 2, it talks about the leadership and the master and the bondservant comparison. Um, it's important that we understand that God is not pro-abusive uh, slavery and belittling of people. But there is biblical evidence that there were times when people needed to pay back a debt. And in order to do that, they worked. They worked for their debt to be paid. And so there's this relationship here that we'll talk about as well. It says, let the elders who rule well, verse 17, be considered worthy of a double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now, let me explain. This does not mean that I should get paid twice as much. <laughs> the double here, actually, is in respect and reward. You can write that down. The double honor in this text is not double reward. It's respect and reward. We should have a respect of honor and uh, material honoring as well. Now, the comparison we would give into the Old Testament is remember the tribe of Levi? Remember, they didn't get land. They were called to minister among the people and give a portion of what they had to the Levites so they could focus on the ministry they had to God. And I think in that regard, I am blessed to say that here at this church, I am cared for. My family is not going without... Uh, the, the needs we have for our family. And this is actually an abuse in the world today in the prosperity gospel where the pastors are living in their third home in the Alps and flying in their private jet. And we can see the danger where, hey, I, I deserve more money. G- give me more money. And that's a loud heresy, I would say, from the gospel that people are self-gain, not ministry-focused. So I would say applaud to you that the The budget that you have for my salary and all those things is great. In fact, some of my friends are not able to be full-time in ministry because they have to work a side job. And if I had to do that, then that would be okay. The Lord would provide. Paul did that. He was a tent maker and a ministry for the Lord. But I am honored to be able to be full-time focused on God's Word, full-time available to minister to the people of this church, full-time studying and visiting and praying because that's what God has allowed me to do. 
The scriptures referenced here come from Deuteronomy 25.4, the shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out its grain. And then quoting Jesus out of Luke chapter 10, verse 7, this idea of labor deserves his wages. That statement there is when Jesus sent them out two by two, and he told them not to take extra clothes, don't even take food, for when you go and minister, the people you're ministering to will take care of you, that they'll provide you a house to live in, they'll provide you some food to eat, for the laborer deserves his wages. And then it gets into an element here I want to talk about specifically in regards to accusations and godly living. Verse 19. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. This concept we see even in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6. Um, where the people of Israel are told, like, death penalty is sometimes needed. Look what it says. On the evidence of two witnesses, Deuteronomy 17, 6. The next slide, please. On the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. But a person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Right? They needed multiple people before they go through these things. Now, I, I bring this up because it's a sensitive thing, because there's two issues here that I'm going to stand in the middle of. On the one hand, we can't take everything that's said against somebody and crucify the people because of what's been said against them. But also, in the world we live in today, we are wrong to not take seriously the accusations brought against the people of leadership. So how do we do that? <laughs> well, let me explain in my ministry what would happen if an accusation came against me. I would step away from ministry, allowing the elders to do the ministry of the gospel, and I would say, search me. <laughs> Lord, reveal the truth. Here are my text messages. Here are my emails. I have nothing to hide. May truth be revealed. And I believe God would bring the truth forward and would dispose against the lies. Joseph was wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife for the sin that he never committed because she wanted to sleep with him and he ran away and made her mad and she accused him for raping her as a non-Hebrew woman. Well, that's not true. <laughs> But the consequences came. The church, I'm well aware my preparation for ministry is such that I know that in the past you used to be an immoral failure from ruining your ministry. Pastors that would have sexual uh, misconduct or even money laundering or abuse from the power that God had given them. But in the world we live in today, we can be an accusation away from the ruining of ministry. Because by the time it's found out as a being a false lie, the damage has already been done. So, Lord willing, myself and the elders of this church are living open book lives. I have nothing to hide in front of you. Ask me the questions. Why are you eating with that person at the, at the local restaurant? Or why are you communicating with this person in this way? And I, I will answer the question as best I can. And if it's a problem, then I need to address it. I need to say I'm sorry. I need to correct the behavior. But it does say here that there are some problems that when we just take one person's word for it and we eliminate an elder, isn't that a great way for the devil to ruin God's ministry? If one person can say something like they did of Jesus, remember, he said he could tear down the temple in three days and rebuild it in one. Well, that's not wrong. Speaking of himself, he did. <laughs> but their goal in it was to crucify him, to kill him to ruin his ministry. So church, my encouragement to you is as a church, know that you have permission to hold us accountable. But Lord willing, there is a getting to know what the truth is. At the same time, if somebody makes an accusation, we gotta take it seriously. Because we live in a world today where too often people have turned a blind eye to that, and that pain has been real and duplicated in the pains of many other lives. That's happened in churches even around here, all around the world. Nobody is beyond the possibility of being questioned. Not even myself, nor any of our leaders. Because look what it says in verse 20. As for those who persist in sin, because there are some who actually are doing wrong, this is a continual doing, persistence. They're sinning and not stopping. What should we do with them? Rebuke them in the presence of all. Now, verse 5, verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1 says, Do not rebuke an older man. But here it's calling us to rebuke him. 
This is a harsh conversation. This is judgment consequences. It says that we should rebuke him in the presence of all so that the rest stand in fear. (laughs) Now, elders and leaders within our church, if we step out of the bounds of what God's called us to do, I pray that we are made an example of in the decisions of the church for our position of leadership. One, it holds me accountable not to step out of God's line, but also it sets an example that nobody is beyond questioning. If we are allowed to church discipline the church, the church should be able to church discipline its leaders. It is a two back and forth kind of a thing. I need you as members of this church family to hold us accountable. If I'm not preaching the truth of God's word, you need to call me out on it. If you see me living a life that's not God-honoring, you need to ask me some questions. And if you and other people see it, there needs to be an agreement, and the elders need to know, and we need to deal with the problem. Because sin is a slippery slope. (laughs) And when we accept the little things that are problematic, it gets bigger and bigger. Moving on in verse 21, he says to Timothy, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging. Do nothing from partiality. Again, church, we we shouldn't judge without doing our research. We need to be involved. We need to ask the questions and pursue the truth. But also, this verse tells us that it is a spiritual matter. It isn't just done amongst each other. It's done in the presence of God, the presence of Christ Jesus, the angels. And partiality is a problem when we say, I'll ask the question of this one, but not that one. Because I... I don't want to do too much damage to the church. This is actually what was said. I'll say his name in this regard because I think it's actually an example of failure that it was said even of the allegations against Robbie Zacharias. Do you know what damage it would do to the ministry if you... That's partiality. That's not good. If there's problems, we need to handle them. We need to deal with them. In 22 and on, it says, do not be hasty in laying on of hands. This is calling people into the ministry, ordaining them. Don't take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Now, my Bible has quotations around 23. Yours might not, but Paul gives this little side note. I think the intention here of, hey, Timothy, it's okay to drink a little bit of wine, especially if your stomach is not feeling well, is this idea that maybe some are charging him or challenging him for his behavior. Remember, asceticism was big in the church, and so you can't marry, you can't eat food, you can't drink alcohol, don't have things of the world, pursue the spiritual, was maybe some judgments that were upon him. And maybe he'd been told previously that he should do this, and they're like, no, don't do that. And Paul's like, no, it's okay, you can drink a little bit of wine. The church, to this point, I want to look at Matthew chapter 11, because some of us were raised in a church where alcohol is bad, and I understand it has bad potential. (laughs) Alcohol has bad um, temptations. And for some of us, myself included, I can't even drink it. But look what Jesus says about John the Baptist. John came neither eating nor drinking. He was a Nazarite. And they said he has a demon. But speaking of himself, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet, Wisdom is justified by her deeds. And I bring this up, church, because Jesus drank. It was called a drunkard by the world. He, he wasn't drunk. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine. That's a sin for sure. But to drink is not a sin. But for some of us, the, what the Spirit moves in us to do. Now, I bring this up because we need to be careful that when we judge one another, especially the leadership of our church, that we're judging it based on what the Bible says, not based on what I want. Now, some of you are really happy that I'm wearing a tie today. But if I went an entire month never wearing a tie, you have no biblical grounds to fire me from my position. Okay? (laughs) Now, there are maybe some conversations you want to have about, hey, why did you stop wearing the tie? And I would have a conversation with you saying, what does it matter what we wear? And we would have a beautiful conversation, and I would say, I want to honor the Lord. But we need to be careful that we don't pass judgment on one another for things that are non-biblical. Now, there are some of us, the Bible says that for some to eat is sin and for others to not eat is sin. And we have to be careful to say, hey, I have a certain standard of living. But it's a little bit like Eve saying, don't touch the fruit. 
God didn't really say, but it's very biblical that we understand the reason why people would say it. Church, some of you need to not drink, but we all need to not get drunk. Biblically, that's what the Bible teaches. So yes, Paul here tells Timothy, it's okay to drink a little bit because that was the medicine of the time. And then he talks about this idea that sins are kind of hidden. We don't always see what people are doing. And there are people that are pursuing a life that seems to be perfect and righteous, but they're actually sinning on the inside. Even the people that are not doing anything in this world, they're sinning in their heart because of their reason for doing it. So sins are hidden, but they'll appear later. And good deeds sometimes are hidden, but even those are not going to remain hidden forever. God, it's important that we know that God sees all that we do. It says even in 1 Samuel that God sees the heart. Man looks on the outside. This is something we need to remember. And then let me finish in this quick statement on 6, 1, and 2. Because there are some that were bond servants that are like, hey, I'm saved, you're saved. Uh, you can just forgive the, the, the debt, right? Or stop working me so hard. Remember, we go to church together. And there's some of these things that we want to take advantage of things of the church community. If you have somebody here that sells you a car in the church, they shouldn't give you a 90% off discount because you're part of the church family. I mean, there's certain things where there's, there's help, but then there's taken advantage of. What does he say to these people? He says that we should regard them as worthy of all honor. We should serve them in a way that's special because the master is a saved person. They must serve all the better at the end of verse 2 because they benefit from their good services. Church, we should treat one another with dignity and honor, and if there's business within the church family, that should be a good thing. But we shouldn't expect that there's a handout because you're part of the church family. And I would say to that point, Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar and God what is God's. And there's a reality that we do need to process through things as believers. But how we interact with one another, the fact that we are Christian or the fact that we are fellow believers should intensify the relationship, not diminish it. That there are leadership that some of you, again, the relationship here at bond servant to master might be true of you as a worker to your boss. Why? Because he tells you when to come, or she maybe, he or she tells you when to come in and when to work and how much money you get, and they're in charge of you. So honor them. And if they're a Christian, honor them even more because you're proud of how they lead you as a believer. And don't be mad at them that they make you work on a certain day. Don't, don't you know that I'm a Christian? You should treat me a little differently. No, they're actually proud of who you are, and maybe they trust you as a better employee because they know you're your morals and your standard on what it means to treat people well. And there are things in that regard that we just need to understand that God wants us to work in this world, Lord willing, alongside other believers. And as the Christian faith in this early movement was tr moving beyond Judaism into the Gentile world, it also wasn't just for the elite of the culture. It was also for the elite and for slaves, and it was complicated in fact, let me finish with this, church. There are some communities where people would never hang out outside the church building, but they hang out together. You actually see this a lot in inner cities where you could have people within the same church be members of different gangs. Why? Because the blood of Christ brings us together. There is a unity here. This is even true of the disciples. You had a zealot in the same group of 12 as a tax collector. And the zealot's teaching would be to kill the man who rebels against the people. And Jesus is like, no, we're going to hang out together. Now, I don't know if you're understanding of the church, but I pray that you see that there is a bond here that should not ever happen. <laughs> that there is a togetherness of the church community, a family peace, that without the Holy Spirit and the blood of Christ would never be possible. We're not a book club. We're not fans of the Bears. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and dwelled by the Holy Spirit. And this should be a different kind of a community. It's not, I really like a Ford better than a Chevy. You go to your own little club or something. No, this is brother and sister in Jesus Christ, saved by the blood of the Lamb. So the connection we have to one another should be deep, should be authentic. It should be meaningful. 
And I pray that the times we spend together, even the Sunday mornings that we're here, that it, it's not just a gathering. It is a reunion. It is honoring to the Lord. Well, this morning, again, the idea of shepherding the flock, I encourage us to be shepherding one another. <laughs> because it's really calling the church to be shepherding each other, to be shepherding the elders, to be shepherding one another as family, to be shepherding those that are in need. And I'm honored to come alongside you in that way. Um, but at the same time, I need you to continue. Because I and the elders that are here and the people of our church need us to honor God today and in the days to come. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. This is the day that the Lord has made, and so let us rejoice and be glad in it. God, I know there are things that we have on our schedules today, but I thank you for time to be still and to know that you are God. God, I pray that we wouldn't check a box having attended a service and heard a message and sang some songs, maybe given some offering. Lord, stir in us to pursue you again tomorrow. That it would be our daily pursuit of you, our interaction with your word and our prayer life, that we would be with you always. You are our fortress. You are our stronghold. You are our shepherd. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So God, I thank you for the reminder even today that we need you, that we need your instructions. Forgive us as people and as a church when we've done things our own way. May your word continue to direct us in the way that best honors you. It's the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.